Good afternoon, everyone. Well, afternoon for at least for those who are in, uh, in Australia. And thanks for joining uh, this uh, first webinar of the year, um, which is actually a joint webinar of our uh, uh, chapter of uh, uh, IEEE EDS New South Wales in conjunction with the, the ARC Center of Excellence, TMOS, which I will talk about it in a, in a second. So we are very pleased to have, I'll be starting a little bit slowly uh, so that people, I see there's quite a few people still joining in. And uh, I'll just give a, a couple of minutes of introductory slides for, uh, to set the context for this uh, talk. So uh, uh, um, we are very pleased this afternoon to have um, a, a seminar by um, Dr. Dennis Daly from uh, DST, so Defense Science and Technology. And as you've seen, the, the title is uh, Advanced Single, Fo Single Photon Sensing and Recognition Technologies for Defense Applications. So, uh, and I know that uh, Dennis will have uh, some very interesting, even last minute uh, additions to show us. So I think it will be really very exciting. Um, so yes, this is part of our uh, job as a, a chapter in New South Wales to keep our uh, membership updated with latest uh, 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 um, advances in, in, the, in the broad area of electron devices and related, of course, here there will be a lot of, uh, um, there will be some optics and photonics, of course, as well. And there will be some interesting electronics in, in terms of, of the approach that uh, Dennis has chosen. So um, I will uh, just uh, do a brief introduction for Dennis. So Dennis has uh, got an, an electronic engineering uh, degree, bachelor and PhD, both from the University of South Australia. After that, he has spent quite a lot of time in, uh, in industry, first for Philips, and then for uh, other companies locally in, uh, in South Australia. And I believe in 2006, Dennis has joined then the DST, so the Defense Science and Technology that at that time probably had another name, um, but it's the same organization. So, and um, these days, uh, uh, Dennis is actually the Emerging Sensor Discipline Lead for DST. And you will see from, from his talk, um, what, what are the, the technologies he's considering now for uh, defense applications. And um, so before starting the, and, and then if I manage to, oh, there you go, on the right bottom here. I wanted to also introduce, because as I said, this is a joint uh, uh, um, seminar between uh, the chapter, but, and also, uh, the ARC Center of Excellence uh, TMOS, which is Transformative Meta Optical Systems. So, um, this is quite, uh, this is a very new um, ARC Center of Excellence. We have officially started uh, in uh, actually 1st of Jan of this year, and uh, we are very excited to get fully in steam with, the, with our scientific program for the next seven years. And you see, as uh, you can see here, so our uh, director for TEMOS is uh, uh, Professor Dragomir Neshev from uh, ANU. Um, there is a big team, as you can see here, is distributed uh, amongst five uh, Australian universities. So ANU, Uni Melbourne, UTS, University of Australia, and RMIT. And uh, so this is very exciting because, uh, um, uh, of course, this is, uh, this starts, uh, 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 the topic is more uh, optical integration and photonics. However, um, as I know from my participation in IDRS, the, the latest roadmap, the, the traditional divisions between electronics and photonics and integrated optics are becoming more and more blurred. So uh, actually we invite more and more of cross fertilization between the different fields. And, and this is an, a perfect example of what actually Dennis is gonna talk about. So without further ado, I would like to leave the floor now to Dennis. Before I do so, uh, a couple of etiquette uh, things just to make everything easier. So uh, it would be great if uh, the um, register, so the, the attendees could, uh, um, when they have questions, they could write it down on the chat. And by the time Dennis has finished going through his slides, we will have at least 15 minutes discussion. 
So I will moderate and, and, and go through the, the questions and, uh, uh, and then so we'll, we'll go through all of them in the end. Um, and also we'll be putting my camera off, will be probably best for, for our bandwidth for everyone. And, um, and yes, so without further ado, I will stop sharing this and uh, Dennis, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Francesca, for the introduction. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> let me just share my screen. Okay. I've still disabled, Francesca, the uh, screen sharing. Okay. Uh, it doesn't let me share, Francesca. But... Yes, I'll, I'll do that just right now. Just okay, sure. My wife, Francesca, is going that, doing that. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's, I guess it's a pleasure to give you a bit of an overview of the work uh, that I'm doing at DST, uh, especially in the space of single photon sensing <clears throat> and SPAD images, uh, single photon LiDAR. All of that, I think, we'll cover today. Um, sorry if I have to mute you throughout the talk because I'm uh, still recovering from a cold. <laughs> so I'll try to get through as best as I can. Um, you go, Vince. Okay, thank you. Um, do you see that, Francesca? Yes. Okay, good. Let's let's start. Okay, um, maybe I'll take my camera off. Would that help? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, Okay, so first I'll give you a bit of context and I'll start with uh, some of the strategic drivers uh, at, at, at DST and how some of this work folds into the capability space. Uh, I'll probably then cover uh, work on the SPAD sensor research program uh, that covers the single photon detectors, uh, the circuits, uh, the different manufacturing approaches we've, we've taken. Uh, then talk about the next generation uh, SPAD array sensor work that we're on we're doing. Um, also talk about the event-based sensing work and then uh, focus on some of the key military applications uh, for the technology and we'll look at both underwater and air-to-surface work. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, in terms of the strategic ST focus, which is science and technology, uh, the Next Generation Technology Fund has nine priority areas. Um, there's advanced sensors and quantum technologies. Um, so SPAD and single photon LIDAR uh, certainly fit under those categories. Uh, around the world, there's a lot of emphasis on quantum imaging, uh, where typically where SPAD is involved. Uh, if you look at the star shots, which is our S&T um, and research, these are aspirational type projects or goals for the organization. Uh, the narrative there is to fit onto remote undersea surveillance and countering self-like technology. So that, that's the, uh, the platform for where, where SPAD fits in the organization. Okay, so what, what, why single photon detectors? Um, it's, it's essentially an enabling technology that uh, it, you, you find it in all types of different applications and diverse areas. Um, and it can be used in all sorts of um, areas where in terms of low light detection, 3D imaging, long range and close range. Um, I think in the best way to encapsulate the work that we do is in remote sensing. Uh, they're circled and uh, especially when coupled with LiDAR and LiDAR type technologies. Um, so single photon detectors, they're unlike your typical CCD CMOS cameras. Uh, which rely on a, millions of photons, like a flux of photons to form an image. Uh, these type of cameras um, are, are essentially operating at the quantum limit, effectively. And that opens up all sorts of applications that I hope to cover today. Okay, so types of single photon detectors. Well, um, there's a different, different classes. Um, SPADs fall in the semiconductor class. And it's a type of photodiode, and it's uh, biased, uh, reverse biased in a specific way. And in the lower 
right, you can see the differences between a photo diode and APD, an avalanche photo diode and a SPAD. So <clears throat> it relies on electron mobility charge carriers once a photon hits. So if you're in the linear mode of the IV characteristic of your photo diode, you're going to have um, a sort of generation of charge carriers. And in this mode, it's called a linear mode APD. If you're biased at the breakdown on the edge, then it's considered a Geiger mode APD. And, and this is essentially what's known as a SPAD, or a single photon avalanche diode. Um, once it relies on impact ionization. So once a photon hits, uh, this is a cascading event and you have a large number of charge carriers generated. So unless it's controlled with some form of quenching circuit, it'll essentially destroy the device. <clears throat> the other constraints around a SPAD is you need specially designed guard rings uh, to contain those electric fields. So on the far right, you can see some commercial off-the-shelf devices. You can get them as discrete single detectors. You can get them as ceramics, arrays, custom devices or integrated, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with uh, CMOS type technologies. Um, so the type of uh, material that we're using is uh, silicon. So where the sensitivity in the visible band, that's 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, of course, you can design these types of detectors in other materials for other wavelengths. And uh, we sort of focus in the middle of the curve at the bottom here in the photon detection efficiency around 532. So lo lots of reasons for that. So, excuse me. Okay, just quickly, just, just want to highlight, this is uh, just from the open literature, just to show you the two different approaches. Uh, you can have a custom SPAD process or you can have a standard high voltage CMOS technology process. Uh, with custom processes, you, you're very much um, tailoring the process to get the best performance out of the SPAD itself. So uh, with standard CMOS, it's, it's, it's highly integrable and you can actually create on chip detector and electronics. So if you look as a typical custom chip that you might find on the internet, um, here you can see the SPADs um, in, the village, in the village you place on the chip. So a lot of electronics is off chip. So there's a, there's a limitation um, about how many SPADs you can have on the chip because of wire bonding and routing issues. So this limits the amount of SPADs um, you can integrate for a custom process. So I just want to show you the concept of operation. And this is very much an animation which is uh, idealized. I think here in green you have the laser and, and this we're showing an active illuminator. And on the, on the right here you have the, the optics <coughs> and, the, and the camera. In this case a SPAD imager or an array. And this uh, stopwatch is representing uh, the ability to count either photons or, or time those photons if you like. So this can be on the chip or it can be off the chip. So in this, in this case, we time when the photon leaves or the laser energy leaves the laser and it hits the target, in this case the tank, and how, how long it takes to hit it and come back to the detector. And that gives you time of flight information. So you can create a 3D image if you like, <coughs> or um, you can actually count an interval of time, uh, how many photons are returning in that uh, space and create an image that way, if you like. So what are the major benefits of SPD technology to military operation? Well, because you're operating at such low photon fluxes, you know, it's very difficult uh, for threat systems to be detected. Um, you can in increase the range of detectability of the target. Uh, you have the option also to see behind obscurance. Uh, and or at very low levels of illumination if you're operating in 2D or photon counting mode. Uh, if you're operating in 3D mode or timing mode, time of flight mode, um, you can get more information from a scene, uh, spatially about the target, um, and this can remove ambiguity that you might traditionally find with normal, normal type images. And SPAD sensors are an out of band type sensor to radar. So they, they would not be um, going to be immune to type those types of countermeasures. So where, where the military environments are very difficult um, and the imaging, imaging conditions uh, are more favorable for, for these types of sensors. Uh, this, the purpose of this slide is really just to, to highlight the different modes and configurations you can operate these types of sensors in. 
Um, in time of flight or scanning mode, uh, you, you're, you're effectively scanning or rastering um, the scene with a laser or some mechanical um, <coughs> uh, gimbal. Um, but this, this is very good when the scene is not moving as much or when the target is, is, is not changing very fast. So it's, it's fairly stationary. We tend to focus on flash LiDAR. And in this case, we have a 2D array or focal plane array. And um, the actual image is instantaneously um, uh, appears on the image. So very good at capturing uh, targets that are moving quite fast. So there are other, other options and photon counting modes, but pretty much for the rest of this talk, we're, we're really talking about flash LiDAR. <coughs> okay, this, this slide is to highlight, um, it's a snapshot of all the SPAD chips that DSD has developed, um, either personally designed by myself or in collaborations with uh, Australian uh, institutions uh, or organizations. The one on the far left is one of the first chips. It's the 32 by 32 uh, SPAD array sensor. It's a CMOS design. Uh, it's a planar chip. And then we progress to a dual mode sensor where we can do time of flight and photon counting mode on the same sensor. And as we go further, we, we, get, we try to increase the number of pixels. So here we have a 64 by 64. And this is something I'll talk about a bit later is an event based SPAD array. It's a 128 by 128. And we also have the next generation, which is using a 3D stacked process uh, to create a, a, a high pixel or array count on the chip. And we're currently working with a commercial partner here in Adelaide to develop um, another type of uh, 256 by 256 planar array. The SEP sensor is a new type of sensor that doesn't rely on impact ionization. That's something that's a collaboration with Sydney University to try and develop an indigenous capability in country. Uh, and it relies on a new phenomena that was, uh, I think, found a few years ago. We got a cyclic excitation process. That's what that stands for. So this is this sort of sensor is, is going to try and remove a lot of the problems that uh, SPAD, SPAD sensors have. <coughs> so if you do a, a deep dive, um, there are a lot of components. Uh, in integrating um, a CMOS type sensor. You, you have the front end circuits, which is the passive and quenching circuit to control uh, the avalanche. You have the readout circuitries, which can be in pixel as shown here by a representative example from the internet. And these typically are digital counters, latches, time to digital converters, memories. You can, you can do a lot of functionality in, in, in the pixel. Um, and of course, you're looking at ways to improve the the detection efficiency of the SPAD itself. So here you can see that um, the SPAD denoted by the round circle is quite large compared to all the other surrounding circuitry. So the fill factor, which is really a ratio of the, the active area of the SPAD versus the area of the pixel is very small um, with, with SPAD type array images. And one of the things you'd like to do is improve that, improve the fill factor, which becomes very difficult when you've got all the um, requirements around designing a SPAD and also putting the actual circuitry in pixel. So we'll look at methods on how we improve that. And one way we do it, what we do at DST is uh, using micro lens, micro lens arrays. And typically we use commercial off the shelf ones where we, we put this on top of the actual imager and it's aligned above each SPAD. And this actually improves the fill factor by focusing a lot of the light down onto the SPAD here. So photons that we would ordinarily miss um, are, are, are channeled through and we can get an improvement about five times in terms of sensitivity. We also had work with um, the, Me the Melbourne Centre for Nanofabrication who were looking at building custom type micro lenses to go on top of the actual SPAD. Here you can see one of the commercial lenses on top. But as we go to high and higher densities, Aligning these uh, micro lens arrays becomes quite quite difficult. <coughs> uh, this slide is to show you uh, the innovation, I think, pathway for a lot of these devices. So the, the actual SPAD arrays are actually designed here at DST. Then we, we, we manufacture these sort of chips offshore. There is no way for fab capable in Australia to do this sort of work. 
Uh, the actual assembly wire bonding and micro lens attachment is done at DST, um, at our um, engineering department. We actually do the design of the PCB interface boards, which take the chip and has an FPGA that communicates with this battery. And this can either be a multi-layer PCB or uh, different actual boards or stacked together like this. We do the actual enclosure and the, the optics uh, also at DST and we create the firmware for the FPGA and the GUI that can either run on a computer that's, a, that's connected to the SPAD camera now or we could use an embedded board, a GPU or CPU board, which is running, could be running machine learning type algorithms or some other form of processing of the actual captured uh, data and images. Here we then, uh, if we're doing, if we're operating these cameras in active mode or in LiDAR type mode, we would couple it with a laser and, and then we could fit it on a gimbal and then we can actually cater for different applications, which I'll talk more about later on. Okay, so this is an example of data captured from one of the SPAD cameras. This is a 32 by 32 in our dark uh, tunnel at DST Edinburgh. This is a 50 meter underground tunnel. Um, we've got two guys walking up and down the tunnel. Um, so these are, these are considered frame-based flash light up because we're capturing all the data from the actual camera. And each pixel here is, is representing distance uh, because they're measuring time of flight. So, the, one of the issues with frame-based cameras is it, they produce a lots of data. And you can imagine as you increase the pixel count for these particular types of sensors, you, you're gonna have a lot of data to deal with. And a lot of it is not really necessary on the film, on, on the actual scene. Also, we also employ range gating techniques, which is also very important. Uh, and this is a way of opening up the SPAD cameras in time to, to focus around uh, an object of interest and deal with all the background noise that we have to somehow try and eliminate and reduce. So how do we improve? How do we improve maximize photon detection efficiency? How do we increase pixel density and reduce noise and increase data bandwidth or reduce the amount of data coming off the chip? Um, <coughs> so a few years back, we looked at different manufacturing um, ways of doing this and the obvious one was to employ 3D stacking using uh, through silicon gear technology. And this is a way of separating the two dyes or two wafers. So the top, the top die can have the actual spads and the bottom die can have just the digital functionality. And they're connected here um, like th via through silicon gear, which is goes through the backside of the top die and connects to the uh, spads on top. So this offers a lot of uh, advantages, but this is only half the story though, because you, you also need to reduce the circuitry uh, and the footprint that sits underneath those particular spads. Um, so over the last uh, 10 years, we've been trying to improve and miniaturize a lot of the circuitries by still retaining a lot of the functionalities that we need. So we started around 80 by 80 microns, and now we're down to about 40 by 40 that we can then uh, implement on the digital die on the lower part of the 3D stack. So just to give you an idea of the scale, a small house dust mite is about 250 micron long. And so we could fit about five of these spads alongside that. <coughs> so this will show you how it was actually built. And these are the partners. So the bottom die was uh, manufactured out of Sotera using a 130 nanometer uh, process, uh, high voltage CMOS process. You can see the top, the top metal connection that will go be through the through silicon beer through the back of the top die. And this was then designed a different wafer, uh, net wafer fab, in a different process. This was a 350 nanometer uh, process out of Fraunhofer out of Germany to build that particular spad. And this will show you how it looks from the very top. <coughs> and as you can see. Uh, we've got a great fill factor. We have just the spads, and this comes out to about 40% fill factor. And most of the electronics is on a different layer completely. Yeah. So uh, we've received the manufacturing, uh, the manufa the dyes, the bare dyes up here. And we've spent the last year and a half trying to actually um, integrate or wire bond these particular chips. 
<coughs> and as you can see here, um, some of the close-up of the Y bonds. There's over 300 Y bonds, and because uh, the it's a 3D stack chip, um, it's higher than your your typical planar die. So we, we've had issues with with Y bonding, uh, the, the curvature. Uh, on the PCB itself, uh, these are very small footprints pads. So we had adhesion problems. We had all sorts of problems. These are uh, multi-layered dies. So we had to look at different ways on how to ensure um, these were, were quite uh, rugged and robust. Um, so we struggled with this for quite some time. And then eventually we, we moved to an interposer design, which is what DST developed. So here's the interposer. It's essentially a cutout, ceramic cutout that goes on top of the, over the chip. So we bond from the chip itself to the interposer and then from the interposer down to the actual PCB layer. So we tried different types of ways of integrating the chip onto a PCB, but in the end we directly wire bonded to the actual chip. So under, sorry, directly uh, wire bonded to the PCB. So underneath this, there's actually also another cutout where we can fit a heat sink, which is shown here in the black. <coughs> and here we are actually testing uh, the full imager. Um, we also have a protective enclosure around the spad to protect the wire bombs. So that's where we are now at the moment. We're, we're testing different dyes, different, uh, with different sort of parameters used in the through silicon via process. Um, so we're, we're about to test next week another two of this. Okay. So, so let, let's just talk, talk briefly about event versus frame based sensors. Um, you might have heard there's a lot of COTS event-based sensors out there, Davis, ADIS, Prophecy. Uh, I'm just showing here an example is one of the first done in Australia through the Monash group. And they developed a, a CMOS event-based sensor. And here they are capturing um, a rotating fan. <coughs> so, uh, so the beauty of these types of sensors is, is, is the amount of data output reduction because you're only um, responding to events that are, that are changing. And this is a 64 by 64 imager, but not as bad. Here's another example of the power of, of, of an event-based sensor versus a conventional camera. Um, here's the, the data output uh, on the right. You can see the amount of um, data that's coming out in the gigabytes versus an event-based sensor. It's only down 30 or 40 megabytes because it's only responding to changes in the scene effectively. So the idea uh, a few years back was let's let's see if we could design a um, a, a SPAD array around an event-based architecture, you know, and how how we try to address the problem of how we're going to deal with the huge amount of data coming off these larger pixel type SPAD arrays. <coughs> these types of architectures are also quite good for. Um, matching with neuromorphic type processing, which can be done off chip. And that's uh, exactly what we, we started off doing. So the first test was to uh, do some, using some real uh, captured SPAD data and applying these um, feature extraction and algorithms to see if we can actually take advantage of the reduction in data bandwidth coming out of these particular chips. And here we have uh, the neuromorphic or the, the neural network being trained to recognize uh, planes of different type. This is all part of supervised learning. And then we wanted to see how quickly they could actually respond when entering the field of view. So here um, you'll see, I'll stop it when it actually comes in view. And oops. So there. So there in 0 0.001 second, it recognized it as an SU35. So, so the power of this type of technology was, was very interesting and uh, offered a lot of advantages. So I designed um, perhaps one of the world's first spat array or neuromorphic, you could call it, or event-based uh, spat array chip. You can see that uh, the architecture is very different to your traditional frame-based system because you have each SPAD is actually, the, set, the idea of a pixel no longer makes sense because it's actually connected to all the other SPADs in this, this macro, if you like. It's, it's called a receptive field. There's four by four that's convolved around the entire chip. 
So they're all looking for a specific uh, feature, and if they find it, they will output an address of that particular location in that receptive field. And there's the actual chip there. Okay, I better focus on uh, some of the key military applications already demonstrated. <coughs> so we've certainly done a lot of work for underwater detection. Uh, underwater mines, um, here we're just showing a secu disc at depth. We've done a lot of stuff uh, for surveillance of camouflage and obscure targets using this sort of technology. Um, here we can show some um, vehicles on the ground and long range detection systems, um, you know, out to 10 Ks, if not more of various targets. Okay, so we've done a lot of, uh, we do a lot of work with uh, Defence Primes and one here in Adelaide is um, BA Systems. So they've taken a, some of the, the, the cameras developed at DST and integrated it into their tracking mount. Um, and this is targeting uh, sea level type threats, those with very low energy transmissions. Um, so this is here, it's shown here and the camera and the SPAD chip developed by DSD is actually on the back here. So you can see in this example, uh, the target is a ball uh, suspended by UAV. And this is what the optical camera that sits next to it is seeing. And you could hardly see it. This is at seven kilometers, <coughs> but the SPAD camera uh, it's no problem. It, it actually shows you the range here, 6.9 kilometers and the actual target. Uh, we also went out with statically looking at targets beyond, beyond 22 kilometers for the same size target here. So uh, what we found is that um, optical cameras have a great deal of difficulty seeing through, you know, scintillation, haze, <coughs> cloud, those sort of issues. Um, whereas with SPAD cameras, you, you don't, you don't, you don't tend to have that problem. So this is just taken recently. We're up here at uh, our test range here in South Australia. Um, and here we've got actually using the SPAD camera to track a target. In this case, it's a fast moving VTOL or a vertical takeoff and lift target. The optical camera here on the other channel shows you the target, but this is actually tracking from the SPAD camera. So I can't get too detailed on the specifics, but um, this one was taken at two kilometers, but uh, there are others at five and beyond. So that's actually tracking, detecting, tracking and imaging. And so this is actually a 3D image. So this is actually take, giving you actual range, instantaneous range of the target. The other, um, so with optical cameras, um, typically we use retroreflectors to sort of align the system. I mean, there's a retroreflector on the moon that people like to bounce lasers off. They're essentially just mirrors. Um, so we, we wanted to test a lot of this with across the Gulf from where we were doing these tests and we can easily see these types of reflectors uh, beyond 22 kilometers. So any type of optical system has some element of retroreflection. So this can be easily exploited. So that just gives you an idea. And you can actually see in this image where, where the actual laser was. In terms of underwater imaging, uh, we went up to the Australian Institute for Marine Science in Townsville <coughs> to do a lot of characterization of the laser and SPAD cameras for underwater imaging. We were looking at, um, uh, profiling, you know, the scattering, backscattering, absorption, attenuation, reflection coefficients. Uh, we were playing with sediments, um, salinity, and we could control all those factors in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, sea simulators they have up there. Uh, this helped inform our simulation modeling tools. We do a lot of MATLAB modeling with this and also um, Monte Carlo photon transport modeling to help uh, guide our our actually experiments. And the next step was to actually go um, out, outdoors. Uh, DST also has its own indoor maritime water tank. We, we can't really control too many variables in this tank. It, there's actually very clear water. So here we are uh, attached to a Navy vessel out 
off Garden Island. Uh, in this picture, you can see littoral water is actually very dirty, uh, coastal type water. So it's actually a, a ch more challenging task to image targets underwater. And here at the Killsby sinkhole, this was very deep, but again, very clear water. So <coughs> water clarity changes uh, depending where you are in the well. So we're trying to get an idea of uh, penetration depth and um, the ability of the sensor to see through different types of water. We also took uh, the technology and, and made a low swap version. Uh, this is uh, working in active mode. Uh, put it on a gimbal under a, a custom built UAV. This is a multi-rotor octocopter UAV that has the actual tech mounted there. And we could basically uh, image objects from, from the air down either on the ground or through the water. Uh, this particular UAV can actually work in a battery mode or tethered mode. So if we could also use it for persistent surveillance. Um, so yeah. This particular laser was, is, is of the same uh, caliber in terms of uh, output power as the one we used for the overland experiments. So the next stuff we did was uh, looking at the ability of the camera to see through obscured targets or targets that are obscured. This is either through camouflage nets, uh, fog or smoke. So here, again, in the underground tunnel, you'll see that we have the actual a target. It's just a white square board. Um, there was actually a broom in the background, not actually shown in this photograph. <coughs> and in front of this, we placed the camouflage net and then we filled the, uh, uh, the tunnel with uh, fog. And you can see that we, these are raw images, a snapshot taken off the camera. We can actually see those targets quite easily through these obscurance. And with a bit of image processing, we can actually pull it out even much clearer and, and remove a lot of the background noise. Um, and then from that, you can apply various um, automatic target recognition algorithms to pick out targets of choice. Yeah. So that was all very easy to do. Then the next step was to do this outdoor. We have a, on site a one and a half kilometer test range. So in collaboration with the army, um, we got hold of some of their blue smoke grenades and which they fired in this container. And we used the container basically just to uh, help focus um, so that the smoke wouldn't disperse too easily and with wind and stuff. And uh, sometimes we'd, we would fire one or two in the container, but here you can see the, the targets obscured by the smoke. And in this case, um, this is what the SPAD was actually seeing. So it could, it could see, it could penetrate through the smoke quite easily and pick out the target of interest. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I always like to end with uh, the words of Elon Musk. Um, he, he tends to put it very eloquently about LiDAR. So, oh, I need to, I need to. Uh, how was that done? Okay. LiDAR is is a fool's errand, and, any, and anyone relying on LiDAR is doomed. Expensive sensors that are, are unnecessary. It's like having a whole bunch of expensive appendices. Like one appendix is bad, well, now they want to put a whole bunch of them. That's ridiculous. Point out that I don't actually super hate LiDAR as much as it may sound, um, but at SpaceX, uh, SpaceX Dragon uses LiDAR to navigate to the space station and dock. Not only that, we, the, SpaceX developed its own LiDAR from scratch to do that, and I spearheaded that effort personally, because in that scenario, LiDAR makes sense. And in cars, it's friggin' stupid. It's expensive and unnecessary, and as Andre was saying, once you solve vision, it, it's, it's worthless. So you have expensive hardware that's worthless on the car. The, we do have a forward radar, which, which is low cost and is helpful, especially for occlusion situations. So if there's like fog or dust or, or you know, snow, the radar can see through that. If you're going to use active photon generation, don't use visible wavelength, because once you, with, with passive optical, you've taken care of all visible wavelength stuff. You want, if you, you, you want to use a wavelength that is occlusion penetrating like radar. So, so LiDAR is just active photon generation in the visual spectrum. 
going to do active photon generation, do it outside of the visual spectrum in the radar. In, in the radar. So I just wanted to point out that, you know, uh, th there is a case to be made for when you want to use active photon generation in the visible versus uh, radar. And in the visible, you actually get better spatial resolution than you do in the, in the radar uh, parts of the uh, spectrum. So, so I just want to end there. No, thanks very much, everyone. I'll just pass over to you, Francesca. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dennis. I really enjoyed your presentation. And uh, your final note was quite, uh, <laughs> quite interesting as well. <laughs> I'm sure. uh, it seems to be very opinionated. I'm sure there's lots of disagreeing uh, uh, opinions on that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite impressive the, the work you've been doing, you'll be leading, because I guess there's a lot of people participating to, this is a big system, so it goes all the way from yeah, uh, uh, electronics, photonics, lasers, uh, AI. So it's, it's really a huge, huge project. Well done. So I'll, I'd like to go over to um, the people yet in these. And I see that there is already one question. It's actually coming from Marius from UWA. And Marius, um, so I don't know, do you see the, the chat is at all, um, Dennis? So I'm going to read it out anyway. OK, yep. yep. Uh, does flash imaging with array uh, use single photo illumination or post burst of illuminating photons and the arrival of individual photos is timed on each pixel. They so ask a clarification regarding the flash imaging that you're using. Yes, so we're using uh, post bursts um, and the arrival of individual is timed on at each pixel, that is correct. So um, the pulse length of our lasers is typically around five nanoseconds. And they're operating around anywhere from 20 to 100 hertz, depending on the application. So if we're, if we're looking at long range, uh, we have a low repetition rate. Um, and so the arrival time um, is, is, if you like, stamped or recorded in each particular pixel for the frame-based type spatter array sensors. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dennis, very much. And so if you're looking at something that's 100 meters away, how large of an area are you uh, illuminating? Did you say 100, 100 meters away? For example, it doesn't, doesn't really, just a, a distance. X. Yeah, it, it depends on, on the optics we, we put on the front and how much we, sometimes we use beam expanders and it, so it, yeah, you, you can calculate exactly uh, the, the field of view uh, at, at 100 meters. So with, with the low resolution SPAD chips, you know, um, it's like looking through a straw. Um, so that's why we're hoping to put in, to try a lot of the high density chips that we're, we're developing to get a better, uh, a, a bigger field of view. So at 100 meters, uh, depending again on the optics and, and the way we configure, if it's in LiDAR mode, you know, you might be looking at something, uh, maybe a person, that sort of size. Yeah, so what, what I'm aiming here at is how easy or difficult is it to keep just that person illuminated? Uh, pretty easy, yes. It, it's, it's very easy to track um, stationary or slow moving targets, for sure. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you. So Dennis, there is another question. It's, it's actually coming from Laurie, UWA. And Laurie, you may ask it your, yourself if you want. Um, nice. Or do, do you want me to, to read it out? In any case, this, the question is, is there a you specific read reason? Out. Oh, you go. <laughs> you go ahead, Laurie. No, you can read it out. Okay, okay. <laughs> is, there, is there a specific reason why through via was preferred compared to flip chip bonding to improve the field factor? Did you consider flip chip at all? Or we did, we did. Um, and I think the reasons are buried in history. Um, I, I'm trying to remember now why we went through the silicon veer uh, way. We, we certainly wanted, I, I think you can do this with a flip chip technique. And I know Laurie, you, you, you employed this type of method. Um, but I can't probably give you a satisfactory answer right now. I'd have to dig up some of the, the history as to why we went down this particular path. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. 
I mean, I mean, it may be just a simple thing that the the foundry you were using has a VIA technology and doesn't have a flip chip technology. <laughs> yeah, um, it could have been something as simple as that. <laughs> yeah, but I there was, was. I was just wondering if there was a specific, a, you know, a technical, a you know, an actual decision made on a technical basis for why one in comparison to the other. But you know, that may not be the case. Yeah. No. 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 Okay. Just just one of the uh, the routes we took. Yeah. Great stuff, by the way, Dennis. Oh, thanks, Larry. Thank you. I do have another question. I'll ask. Can I ask it verbally? Yeah, yeah sure. Go sure. Ahead. Um, what are the issues related to the fact that you are using visible wavelengths? So uh, uh, the, for, the, you the know, big one. Yeah. Yep. Go on. Yep. The, the big would one you, is. Would you, if you had your choice, would you prefer to be using other wave another wavelength? Yes, yes. Uh, this, <clears throat> we, I can't go too much details as to why we like Visible because a lot of this technology feeds into other programs, which is uh, highly sensitive. Um, as you know, Visible is, is not an eye safe wavelength, mm -hmm. um, but there's certainly a big uh, a demand to move to other wavelengths, um, specifically 1.5 or even at two microns. Um, and that, that's certainly the case. And certainly something uh, DST is, is trying to, to get um, traction in, if you like. But it's very difficult in Australia because of um, uh, it's hard to get access to those particular uh, foundries to, to, to build arrays or focal plane arrays in, in these type of materials. Right? So. Um, these are more exotic, more expensive, and more challenging. Um, I think our view was that if we could demonstrate uh, through silicon veer or 3D stacking uh, with CMOS and silicon, uh, we should be able to replace the top layer with another layer of material, uh, whether it's Mercat or Ingas. And, and certainly we, we would have an imager um, at a different wavelength. The, the, the other way of doing this is of course using scintillators or or films on top of the existing silicon spads to try and uh, do an up conversion of the wavelength. Um, so we, both 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 avenues is something uh, uh, that we're, we're trying to pursue. Yeah, yeah that, uh, it's sort of the the question also links back to my previous question regarding the flip chip bonding because um, a flip chip bonding cap uh, uh, architecture does allow you to um, merge your silicon processing electronics, whatever you want to call them, with whatever 2D array you can get your hands on, right? Yes, yes. So I, I would have thought it makes it a lot more flexible. It's not so married together between the two chips. Um, yes, uh, but don't, don't forget, um, a lot of this stuff is front illuminated. So I think with the flip chip, we would need to have a cutout on the bottom and then we would have to... But you can remove the substrate. Yeah. That's fairly standard. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Laurie. Um, I'm actually very happy to see a, 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 a good application for 3D technologies because we, we have been working so long in, in industry to develop that. And uh, I mean, for, for a long while, it's been lagging behind also for reliability for problems and things. But I think for, for a neuromorphic, like relatively low power system, that that should work quite well. That's, that's, that's good to see that in, in, in action. Yeah, it, it truly, French, it truly, it's an international effort. I mean, the the design, the, the manufacturing, um, the assembling, it, it, it's it's happening all around the world. It involves uh, very a lot of different partners. In, in fact, the the final stage of taking those two wafers, I mean, through silicon via can only occur at eight winch out of the Fraunhofer ICM out of Berlin. Um, that itself was was tricky to do, and so. It's truly a, a, a global effort in trying to develop that chip, yeah. In the meantime, there is another question that popped up on the chat. So it is from Yang Yang. 
from UTS. So uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, me, I know the top layer was used for PCA design, so photo, photopic conductive antenna array. Are you familiar with that? Uh, my note, the top was used for PC. I'm not sure what, what that means, PCA designs. Hmm. Um, yeah, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. It might be easier. Oh, hi, uh, Dennis, uh, it's Ian here. Uh, thank you for the talk. And just uh, PC actually is the photonic uh, conductive um, antenna. Uh, that's because um, uh, from the um, our perspective, normally we have a, uh, we use a top metal layer for the on-chip antenna device. I'm not quite sure if uh, you use the same technology for the photonics uh, um, system. Um. No, no, these, this is a typical, um, for, the, for the planar chips, it's typical CMOS process. So your, your typical metal layers, high top metal layers. And for right. the 3D, again, that, that, that's your typical type of CMOS process again. So we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't employ any type of uh, antenna array structures on the top metal. Oh, okay, that's all right. Okay, thanks a lot. Right. No worries. And Dennis, in the meantime, can I ask you another question? So uh, I saw your big leap when you went from a single SPAD per, you know, per chip and you went to a distributed distributed SPAD, which was certainly quite a, quite a challenge. So uh, did that improve significantly? Because I, I guess, do you, do you feel that like you have that spaces at all now or, or is there still improvement that you can do on that side or? Has that fixed? So for, for the 3D stack, you're, mm. you're talking, yeah. Um, it, it's certainly a big improvement. And, um, and certainly from, from an, the optical side of the designs, um, it, it's something everybody really likes to uh, leverage. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, and you, you would have noticed from the presentation uh, that the top level spat still because of the size of making a SPAD is quite big. Um, you're never going to get like 100% because of the guard rings and just the nature of creating the SPAD, but uh, a 40% um, improvement or 40% fill factor. And then you can look at applying um, sort of micro lensing. You really would have a very sensitive uh, SPAD. And plus you don't have the crosstalk issues as well when you when you put a SPAD next to all the electronics in per pixel uh, because it's on a separate layer altogether. So um, there's a lot of advantages in doing it this way. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So let me see if there is any more questions popping up on the chat. Um, I don't see, I, I have many questions I, I would like to ask you, but I might <laughs> just wait for <laughs> when we meet in person next time. Sure. Uh, but one thing I did want to ask you, since uh, since you put in that that uh, little uh, piece from from uh, Elon Musk, do you? Uh, sorry, Francesco. It, it, do you, you agree brought... with the statements? Um, I think. Uh, well, Elon was really talking about the advanced driver assistance systems, you know, ADS and stuff, and that that what he was focused on. And I, I don't think you'll find a lot of people in the industry who are working in LiDAR would perhaps agree with him. I mean, <clears throat> when you were talking about uh, collision avoidance and autonomous vehicles, you, you really want a lot of different sensors to help remove the ambiguities in the scene. And uh, sure, LiDAR is a bit more expensive, uh, but I think, I think certainly um, Tesla would have um, avoided a lot of problems they've had with their cars and their vision system if they had included a LiDAR. <laughs> <laughs> I think one car went in the back of a truck or something. So, um, so I don't, I don't fully agree with 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 his comments. No, no. No, and I fully agree with you that redundancy in some critical systems yes. will be really, really, really important. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Yes. So uh, yeah. Um, so Denise, I think we are in perfect time. Perfect timing. So two fifty-seven. So we are just before the the three o'clock. Um, I don't want to take too much of, uh, of people's time, but uh, 
on behalf of everyone, I still wanted to, so it was a great talk. So again, thank you very much for, for agreeing to give this, uh, this seminar for us. And, uh, and we'll certainly continue the conversation. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much.